One of the things we don't see in a chauvinistic culture is the science of the psyche, the science of psychology. We don't get an experiential understanding and a kinetic understanding in the way that we might learn how to uh, do framing in a house or uh, assemble Legos. But there's a very clear pathway uh, of predictable movement of energy within the paradigms of our current cults and cultures. And there is a science. And so let's look at some of the building blocks because you have to understand in architecture, if you want to change, for example, the first floor or remove and replace the foundation, you can't just do that in, you know, with a skyscraper standing or it'll crash down. And, and so it's important to understand the sequencing with which things are built uh, so that you can explore alternatives. Uh, we start off with the law of mass. The law of mass is the bowling ball and the pinball. When the bowling ball collides with the pinball, the pinball goes flying, the bowling ball continues because it's bigger, the law of mass. So this is also the law of scale. The grown-up is 10 times heavier and bigger than a newly born infant. And it's only gradually that that change takes place. And we know from elephants and the way that they refuse to challenge the kind of confines and habits that they've become accustomed to in childhood. An elephant baby, you know, will cut its leg trying to kick its way out of a small rope or chain. But a giant mature elephant could kick the entire fence and building and break the chain. But they never try because they've been habituated. And we see the dynamic with children and their parents that there's a tendency to relate to the parent not as an adult, but as a five-year-old would in the same patterns of behavior. Uh, and so we have scale, the giant and the little one. This is a fundamental dynamic in uh, any cult or culture because all relationships consist of this kind of disproportionate scale at birth and often later in power structures. Uh, you know, when one has a disagreement with one's government, but they have a monopoly on power. Sounds familiar, of course. That was the dynamic uh, with parents. The government says that all killing is bad except when we do it. All imprisonment and physical violence is bad except when we do it. And who do we do it to? Our citizens. Um, and so you have this dynamic, um, the law of mass, the little one and the giant. Now, when you have a, an imbalanced relationship, a disproportionate relationship like this, and you combine it with institutionalized emotional and traumatic illiteracy, so it's, it's, it's not just that uh, you know, one or two people don't know. You can go cradle to grave in the American cult and not receive a single formal hour of emotional or traumatic literacy. So when you have a huge imbalance in scale and you don't learn the art of attunement, uh, you have violation, you have trauma. And when the giant does not attune to the child, but in fact inflicts corporal punishment, you know, hitting, pulling ears, threatening, abandonment dynamics, 
Um, you, the, there's too much energy to absorb. You see, the reason that a pinball goes flying when it makes collides violently with a bowling ball is the bowling ball is so much bigger that the pinball lacks the ability to absorb the energy of a bowling ball. Now, if the pinball was five times bigger than the bowling ball and made of the same stainless steel, then it would be the bowling ball that bounced off. And if the pinball was a hundred times bigger than the bowling ball, it would be the bowling ball, you know, that went flying with the pinball continuing on its trajectory. And it's very significant to note that the law of mass and the law of intelligence are diametrically opposed. The law of mass is might makes right. I'm bigger than you, what are you going to do about it? And that's a good question. However, it has nothing to do with intelligence. The government is often wrong. The parents are often too uneducated to understand that they're in uneducated and you know, equally often wrong. The culture, the police, the power structures are often wrong, but they're bigger. And the demand that the individual, that the child fit in to the box, to the paradigm uh, dictated by this bigger energy is not the law of intelligence, it's the law of mass. The law of intelligence is in fact quite the opposite because the law of mass tends to ultimately rely on the majority. If the majority of people will allow it, then it happens. If the majority of people push for it and apply their energy, then it happens. But what happens has nothing to do with intelligence. It simply has to do with the fact that in a tug of war, in a tension between two energies, the side with the most people wins the tug of war, even if they're going in the wrong direction to their own stated goals. Uh, and the law of intelligence is actually a bell curve. And so when any new technology, a technology of thinking, a technology of feeling, a technology of communicating, a technology of transportation, when any new technology is developed, it is developed by one person or a very tiny group of people. Generally speaking, the majority tries to kill it. The majority doesn't want to hear the new idea. When the Wright brothers uh, invented airplanes that could fly for the first time, oh, it was a joke. There was no use for them. When the telephone was invented, no use for that either. Uh, Bill Gates had a terrible time convincing investors and people that anyone would have anything to do with a computer. Uh, because conventional knowledge said, you know, there's no point in it. So when any new cutting edge technology is developed, it is always developed by a very tiny number of people. And the majority, statistically speaking, attacks them. The law of mass goes against the law of intelligence. Um, and, and yet it is ultimately the majority that wins if they fail to kill the new technology. So uh, ultimately, if the minority that invented the technology gets some early adopters, then you have a small minority, then you go up here. And then by the time that everyone is using it, when the majority is all using corded telephones, someone else invents a new technology. And not just someone else, a very tiny person or a very small group of, of people invents the new next thing. And therefore, if you want to find the most intelligent people 
anywhere, in any cult throughout history, you have to look to a minority, often uh, being harassed or oppressed or denied by a majority. The majority has the mass, the minority has the intelligence. Not all minorities, but the most intelligent people in any technology are always the smallest number of people in that technology, in any field. The very best piano player, it's not the majority of piano players, it's one, two, or three people. Uh, and so uh, the problem with the bowling ball and the pinball collision is that the pinball is often correct, but outnumbered. The child is often correct, but outnumbered. The citizen is often correct. The employee is often correct, but outgunned by senior management. You have the law of intelligence, which is the law of minorities, and you have the law of mass, which is the ignorant or mediocre majority. Because all mediocre, me, mediocrity is relative to excellence, and excellence is also on a, on a continual uh, bell curve. You know, it's, it's, it's never done. It's all relative to what was going before. So trauma is too much energy to absorb in the conflict between parent and child, between child and a gang of bullies, between child and older siblings, between uh, the child and a school system, a government, a culture, a racist culture, a bigoted culture. There's a sociopathic element. There's an ignorant element in every cult, in every culture. And so the child is traumatized. An energy mass hits them. A bowling ball hits them as a pinball and they go flying. And it's the most horrible feeling a human being can deal with. Shock, dissociation, powerlessness, helplessness, loneliness, unlovability, why did this happen to me? It's the pits of being human. And out of that comes an orientation, a motivation uh, in every human being. I never want to feel that way again. Ever. I never want to feel so out of control. I, I, I don't want to feel it. And uh, in, this, uh, in this dynamic, let's see if we can find a better, yeah. In this dynamic, I never want to feel this way again in a world that is much bigger than me. You also have the birth of distrust. I don't trust the world that did this to me. I don't trust the parents that did this to me. I don't trust the world that did this to me. I don't trust the government that stood by and did nothing. I don't trust the hypocrisy of the grown-ups. This is all for your own good. When does hitting a child help them? You know, there isn't, there isn't any answer to that. It's, it's, it's a very shallow argument. Now, out of the distrust that is natural and endemic to being traumatized by one's caregivers, older siblings, whatever, comes the need to control. Because if you don't trust the larger world, if you don't trust the power structure, then you don't want that to be in control. You want agency, you want power, you want to medicate the helplessness, so you want to be in control. Now, that's a reasonable strategy, but the world is a billion, 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 billion times bigger than we are. It's heavier, it's more space, it's more complicated, it's very, very big. So we develop a fear of all of that bigness 
because we don't trust it. And out of that fear, we seek a strategy to be in control. So this pattern of energy is the default pattern of every single person raised in our cult to one degree or another. And one of the most common strategies is to, is to create a small, familiar world inside the big, complex, scary world in which to hide or reside in, in fear. Now we also look at strategies for control. You can think of a secret as a strategy of control. If you don't know what's going on here, you cannot affect it. If you don't know where I've hidden my money, you can't take it. So it's fear of losing control. So we have secrets. We have lies as a more overt expression of secrets. I told you that I'm going to go over there today, but I'm really going over here. So you can't control me because I'm not there. You also have uh, trust in dominance and attachment to, to tradition. So I want to be higher in the hierarchy. I want to own the company. I don't want to work for anyone. I don't trust them. I don't want anyone to tell me what to do. All of this is out of this need to control because it's really important to understand that this is predicated first on the law of mass, then on emotional and psychological illiteracy, leading to systemic childhood trauma. Because this trauma is so rampant that it doesn't occur to many of us that control actually takes a lot of work. You know, if I want to run a company, if you look at the top CEOs of most competent companies, they have longer hours, higher accountability, or on their cell phones all the time. They have less freedom in some ways than the average employee who can just go home and stop working for the weekend. Many top CEOs work 70 hours a week. Elon Musk regularly works 100 hour weeks and refers to the phenomena of starting a company like eating glass and staring into the abyss. That doesn't sound like fun, does it? So what's leading to this need to be in control? If being in control is so much work and if there's so much competition in a fear-based traumatized culture, to get to the top and be the one in control. Wh who, why are people wanting to work this hard? Because if you've got a competent, psychologically attuned culture that raises children with little or no trauma and rapid traumatic repair, and high levels of competency leading to high levels of abundance, there is an enormous amount of energy on this planet such that every human being can meet all of their human needs hundreds of times over with the resources on the planet. The need to survive, the need to feel secure in that survival, the need for love and belonging, the need to have clear principles, ideals, and live up to them to earn self-esteem, the need to discover one's talents, abilities, and develop them, the need to bring those competently into the world and create abundance, and the need to be a part of something bigger 
than we are. Every human being has these needs. And there are cultures, there are cultural identities, there are individual identities, patterns of thinking, feeling, speaking, doing, and being that are a hundred times more efficient than what we're doing at fulfilling human needs per unit of energy invested. And that's the metric of intelligence. That's the continuum of intelligence. Intelligence is measured by the efficiency with which time, money, natural resources is transformed into sustainable human well-being, which begins for each person by fulfilling each of our basic needs. It's easy to do relative to our culture. But in an it's very difficult to do from a state of willful blindness predicated on chauvinism because this emotional traumatic illiteracy doesn't just come out of nowhere. It comes out of a brick of a foundation of chauvinism. Because Mr. Chauvin, an arrogant Frenchman, convinced himself and then a lot of other people that not only men were better than women, but masculine energy and masculine expression was superior innately to feminine expression. And Chauvin ignored all the science to the contrary. And so does every cult that's chauvinistic. You look at every single religion, no female representation at the top of the religion. You look at more than 95% of the world's power structures, it's predominantly men. But chauvinism is much deeper than the overvaluing of men and the undervaluing of women. Chauvinism is the dogma that says that outer science is more important than inner science. So how do we get an, a cult of entirely psychologically illiterate people? How do you manage to go from cradle to grave in a civilized cult without a single hour of formal emotional training? You pull it off with chauvinism because emotions are feminine. The inner psyche is more feminine than the outer world. The outer world is important. The inner world is just your feelings. So sustained willful ignorance and illiteracy is founded on chauvinism. Uh, and so it leads to trauma. Now, if, if you want to be in control, one of the best things that you can do is fight all change. Two men want to be lovers. It's not the main thing people have been doing the last few thousand years. So let's stop it. Why? Really be so devastating if men were affectionate with one another? Is there any rational reason to attack men because you, you don't find, you don't find like the Catholic Church excommunicating people for going to war. You know, according to Catholic dogma, killing is a commandment and absolutely bad. But we're not going to excommunicate preachers who have been to war and killed hundreds of men. That's fine but show affection because that's normal. The status quo is a self-referential dogma that bolsters itself on the sole premise that it has been done before, that the majority are doing it now, and apparently, therefore, should do it for all time. Someone fear of change is going to support that dogma, because when you want to stay in control, your biggest fear is the unknown. If your biggest fear is the unknown, 
then your biggest agenda is to stop all change. Because if nothing changed at all, it would all be known. It'd be boring. All evolution and life would stop. But you wouldn't have to fear the future. Because all fear is pain in the past feared in the future. This painful thing happened to me when I was five years old. I couldn't stop it. Because I couldn't stop it, I'm afraid of it happening again. I'm therefore afraid of pain that could come in the future. I'm afraid of pain in the future because I'm afraid of pain in the past because I don't want to feel it there either. And I'm stuck and I want all life to stop as a way of protecting me from an out of control future. So we come to attacking and fearing change is one of the strategies along with lies, secrets, holding on to traditional, looking to be in power, etc. Uh, and, uh, and the whole machismo dynamic, male or female, of I'm tough and I'm not going to back down and all of this stuff. It's all a little kid terrified of being traumatized again by an illiterate and a psychologically illiterate bigger and superior mass, uh, which you know leads directly to the distrust of all that is. Why would you trust God if God set it up this way? Why would you trust yourself if you couldn't stop the pain? Why would you trust other people if they said they loved you and did this to you? It's perfectly understandable how we get to distrust and how we seek in a psychologically illiterate paradigm and framework, in a traumatically illiterate framework and paradigm, how and why we try and, and stop all life to protect ourselves from the vastness of the unknown. Because 99.999% of all that is, is not only unknown, it's unknown, unknown. And if you have something that big and you grasp that, and you have a deep distrust of life and its pattern, you are going to be in absolute terror. Because it's so big. What we don't know and don't know that we don't know is so big compared to the tiny little sliver that we know that if it wasn't for the repetitious minutia of going around in circles doing the same old, same old, thinking the same thought we thought a thousand times, if it wasn't for this obsessive compulsion to hold on to the past identity, the pattern of thinking, feeling, speaking, doing, and being, we'd be overwhelmed. We'd be overwhelmed, and the pattern that we've developed would lose coherence. Because for the most part, just like every cult on the planet is massively unintelligent, Every identity on the planet, every pattern of thinking, feeling, speaking, doing, and being has massive room for improvement when exposed to more information, when exposed to more complex energy patterns. It falls apart based on the data, but we cling to it anyway based on fear. Most of us will go to war happily risking our own life rather than threatening the known with the unknown by allowing another force, another person, another group to shift our identity, 
our pattern of thinking, feeling, speaking, doing, and being. And this makes the science of identity the most pivotal science in human evolution that is sublimated through the blinders of chauvinism that just sees no value through those lenses, the blindness of chauvinism. Because every scientist who cuts an orange in half says they're absolutely equal. A polarity, yin and yang, masculine and feminine, up and down, black and white, a polarity by definition is equal. And the whole, the synergy, out of which a polarity is often synthetically generated by artificially cutting an ecology, a sphere, into two parts. In order to become one, in order to reassemble the sphere, we have to put back together both halves of the whole. Now, according to Mr. Chauvin, all of that's wrong. You are, can just, you, half of a circle is adequate. Maybe we should cut Chauvin's bicycle tires in half and let him experience the torment of his own stupidity. When you cut a sphere, an ecological framework, into two polar opposites, and dissociate them from one, one another. You have dis-ease, the same dis-ease that everyone experiences when a bicycle wheel is no longer round.